should you wonder why you're seeing me in place of someone uh, in a surplus or a collar, I thought it best to lead by saying that no, you're not hallucinating, and yes, this is a stewardship sermon. Some of you may recognize me, and some of you may think you recognize me because this town is absolutely rife with bearded white guys who look just like me. But if you don't fall into those categories, um, despite being a newer member here, the real reason for this is because as I have learned, the more involved at St. Paul's I've become, we are an 8 a.m. family. And with Father Joe behind me, I should also say we're an 8.05 a.m. family, in complete honesty. Uh, in any event, I'm Jeff, and it's an absolute privilege to be speaking with you wherever you are and whenever it is. I will start, um, I'll start though with a, a story, my Uncle Jeff, for whom I'm named, at my grandmother's funeral a few years ago, uttered some of the most honest words about speaking to others that I know. Um, and I, I think about them often, and I'm thinking about them particularly standing in a pulpit. Uh, when he stood to speak, he said, you each had your own relationship with, with Ruth, my grandmother. Memories of her. I cannot tell you your truth of her, only who she was to me. And it's in that spirit I address you. I cannot tell you the truth of St. Paul's or of these readings, and I cannot imagine that anyone would ask me to, um, but I can tell you what they mean to me. A professor once explained the difference between pravda and astina, two Russian words for truth as the difference between the little everyday factual truths and big essential truth, truth with a capital T. I hope in offering you my little truths, you're encouraged to dwell on your own and are reminded how they and, and perhaps that truth with a capital T came to be for you. I'll start with today's gospel. Uh, quickly note that the truth of St. Paul's is for me synonymous with what first brought me through the doors I'm looking out at now uh, and a person that I can see down in the pews. Um, a search for something new, a, a compromise, a sense of, of joining together. My wife Martha and I were married here, standing just over there, um, one of the last with the red carpet. I believe. Um, it remains truly the happiest day of my life uh, and one I get to relive every time I'm in this hallowed building. We were both raised in different, if analogous, traditions and we're looking for something that could be ours together, a, a place that felt like home to both of us. Um, I note this all because while I'm not a lawyer, I am now married to one. Uh, and the closest I ever get to feeling like I might truly understand the mysteries and life of Jesus is as he is put to test by an attorney. Um, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus replies immediately, decisively, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Far better guides to the meaning of the first and greatest law exist, most of them right over there. Um, so I would instead like to speak for a moment to the second. As I said, my wife and I grew up in, in different traditions. I was raised Catholic, attended Catholic school, fasted and guilted my way through adolescence and into adulthood. I even spent a summer with nuns detailing a, a short history of their life and work um, while, while in college. Um, this is to say that as things go, I was pretty Catholic. And, and so much of it innately appealed to me. The history, how it shaped history, the beauty, the art, some of the music. I sought out cathedrals, lit candles, knelt on dusty floors um, when our, on work trips and in conversations, uh, work trips and vacation, excuse me. Uh, I developed a sincere appreciation for quiet places, for reflection and introspection. I would say actually living with those nuns, women of the deepest faith I have ever met, accelerated my journey towards something and, and somewhere new. They were radical women, CEOs, CFOs, doctors, and pharmacists, when women were otherwise shut out of the higher echelons of the workplace. It was in response to one of the last great pandemics to shape this country, they were called into service and thrust into these roles, founding a hospital to treat influenza patients in 1918, because no one else was willing to do it. And it did not stop them there. Um, I remember finding an article from the 70s on microfilm sister's friends, pill poppers and addicts, uh, about a clinic they were opening, and a conversation with another sister, well into her 60s at the time, who still backpacked into remote reaches of the Andes, teaching uh, nursing and community health. 
And to me, if my church could not say that these women deserve to lead in other ways, if it could, in my eyes, turn its back on the LGBTQ communities and, and other neighbors we're exhorted to love as ourselves, if it could instead deal with them with anger and vitriol, despite all that I love and for family for whom it still has deep meaning, it could not be a place for me, and I left. For Martha, growing up in Birmingham, her church provided community, linking faith and a, a sense of place together. For me, church had always been more a place of privacy and, and solitude, maybe even isolation, um, a space for looking inward. When she moved here, Finding those roots was important to her in a way that I didn't fully understand. Um, and the same was true in the reverse. My lack of place didn't denote a lack of faith. Hesitation was born from questioning and disappointment, um, not from rejection. Uh, as I said, we were married here, um, just to my left. St. Paul's has become a community for us both, a place both of quiet meditation and deep communal sense of belonging. It's where we come for Paul's holiday concerts and eat lunch with friends and colleagues. I sat circled up with trainers from the Racial Equity Institute and community leaders of different faiths and backgrounds to discuss a path forward for more equitable, inclusive Chattanooga. We've come to hear lectures on faith and humility and against hate. St. Paul's leverages funds and influence to support refugee resettlement, women's health, to eliminate food insecurity. The church quite literally provides shelter for the unhoused under the same roof and it launched a child care center in response to inequity facing both our working families and children in our school system. Maybe this all goes without saying. Maybe it's so commonplace here that it paradoxically cannot be taken for granted. But as someone who was once searching, who has experienced something different, I'd invite you to reflect for a moment on the ways in which St. Paul's embodies how we can love our neighbors. To step back to scripture again, and as an Old Testament person, Deuteronomy is perhaps my favorite book, um, in this reading in particular. This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Legacies are complicated, complex things. Leah, last week, spoke to you of all this church and this community have endured and survived written on these walls. In my work, we focus on one narrow band of the systemic challenges which face our neighbors, challenges that have been exacerbated by and highlighted in this particularly fraught moment. I've obsessed over the nature of legacy since the onset of the crisis and how it has taken a literal global pandemic for us to recognize some of these injustices, um, especially for those of us who aren't forced to live them every day by virtue of zip code or race um, and, and so on. What will be the legacy of this time can we leave this moment different, change from the way we started it? Uh, started it? How? I, I will tell one other story of how I came to know St. Paul's. When I was working for the Public Education Foundation, uh, one of my now wife's colleagues, Nelson Irvine, very kindly invited me to lunch. Uh, and we talked about a partnership between his church um, through their outreach committee, a committee I am now very grateful to sit on, uh, and Orchard Knob. He said at first they had gathered books to donate, but the librarian, as an advocate for our students and, and honestly taking a risk, had said as much as they appreciated that donation, they wouldn't really be able to use many of them. Um, the school was missing specific titles associated with specific standards, competencies, gaps in the curriculum. It wasn't that they weren't grateful, it's just that other factors were at play. A version of this scenario plays out quite often, I think. Um, I have some strong feelings about the word charity and the ways in which it can be something other than loving your neighbor how it can be instead a way to differentiate and distance and say, we are not connected. What happens to you doesn't impact me. Whatever I do is good enough because it's better than what I think you had before. What happened next was that the outreach committee instead asked, then what books do you need? Because the act of donation was not the object, an outcome, change, a relationship was. It's sort of a wild radical idea to ask a person who does a job every day who lives life differently from you, what it is they need, how things might be better, rather than telling them what you think they need or how they can change. I know from that conversation with Nelson that the outreach committee was able to provide those books and then continued to ask what else, a washer and dryer, uniform clothing and so on. Um, acts of love, I'd argue, and not simple charity. By virtue of that recognition and response to a need, um, and it, it should be added the agency and the resources to take such action. 
this was for me truly the first inkling of how special this place can be and how different. What is possible when people share an idea of community, of compassion, empathy, and profound love for our neighbors. Moses does not cross over to this promised land, but his children and theirs on down to us do. This meditation on legacy, not of how we're perceived or even remembered, but by how those who come after us and alongside us live, I think appropriate for this year and, and for a sermon about stewardship, particularly as it relates to how I have come to appreciate and feel at home at St. Paul's. What will my, your, our legacy be? You sweep us away like a dream, we're read in Psalm 90. We fade away suddenly like the grass, we respond. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. I thank you sincerely for the time, uh, your time and the honor of addressing you um, tonight, uh, this morning, later in the afternoon than you meant, whenever it is. Please know that in sharing my own self, my little truths of what St. Paul means to me and to us, that it is most certainly an expression of love and of what dearness um, I hold you in, my neighbors.